Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for all taking time out of your day to come out today. Um, I'd like to thank Mrs. Betty Sit, gorgeous Betty, um, for hosting and for always opening up her home uh, to our learning programs. Um, Yeshiva Flatbush has a committee of women that provide opportunities for learning for all ages um, outside of the classroom. Uh, really lishma, that's what it's called. Um, we learn for the sake of learning and knowing and growing. And uh, this summer, we this is the last class of a three-part series on the three mitzvot that are specific to women, mikveh, chala, and neira. Mrs. Yafa Seton, it's an honor to have you here today. Um, I just met you, but right away I saw this adorable, vivacious personality, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, so thank you. Uh, for participating. And uh, I'd like to mention that all the learning that's been going on this summer has been dedicated in memory of Jack Charles Levy, Ishayahu Ben Chava, by the Levy family. And um, his neshama should continue to be elevated uh, by the scoot of, through the scoot of our learning. Um, if anyone is interested in in making a donation to Yeshiva Flatbush, we have a fitness center that's gonna be donated in Jack's memory as well. The valued exercise and, and worked out a lot. And it's something that our students are gonna benefit from greatly, especially like all the team members. Um, we're very excited about it. There's a link on the Yeshiva Flatbush Instagram, YOF or YOFHS. Um, you could you could donate the credit card uh, just by clicking on that link, or you could write out a check to Yeshiva Flatbush and put in the note, um, Jack Levy Fitness Center. Without further ado, thank you, Mrs. Satin. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so again, I just want to acknowledge that today's learning is in memory of Jack Charles Levy, Yeshayahu Ben Chava. Um, all the learning that we do should uh, serve to elevate his nishama, and may this be attempt to, to be a start of a source of comfort to the family. So we're here today to talk about the last of the three mitzvot that pertain to women. Before we start talking specifically about candle lighting, I want to talk about the category in general. Um, so like we know, right, the three mitzvot that we have are hafrashat chala, nidat harad mishpacha, and hadlakat nero. Can anyone think of the first time this group is sort of hinted to in Tanakh? It's not really explicitly in the Pesukim, but it's associated with a certain person, Sarah. Okay, we see that from, um, it's like I said, it's not explicitly in the Pesukim, but when Yitzchak brings his new wife, Rivka, back to Sarah's Ohel, so the Pasuk says as follows. Read it so that I don't miss the word. Um, okay, by Yevi'eha aha Ohela Sarah imo, Yitzchak brings Rivka to the tent of Sarah, his mother. Vaikach et Rivka, and he takes Rivka, Vatihilo Leisha, she becomes his wife, Vayeehabeha, and he loves her, Vainachem Yitzchak Acharei Imo, and Yitzchak was comforted after his mother's death. And the commentaries ask, okay, so what does that mean? He was comforted after his mother's death. And Rashi quotes the Midrash that says that all the Berachot that Sarah's tent had returned when Rivka was brought into the tent. What were the berachot of Sarah? She had a bracha on her candles. They lasted from week to week. 
she had a bracha on her chala that it stayed fresh from week to week, and she had a cloud and anan over her tent. Okay. Now the the commentaries parallel this to women's our three mitzvot. But even without the commentaries, right, I don't think it's so far-fetched for us to come up with this conclusion on our own, right? So how do these, how do these berachot parallel? Candles, quite obvious, right? We like candles. Chala, the bracha and her chala parallels our mitzvah that we have hafrasha chala. And the cloud over the tent parallels our keeping of hilchot tarar ha the laws of family purity. Right, I'm, I'm sure you all know the statement, Ish ve'isha zachu, shechina shiruya b'nehem. A man and a woman who, who, who merit to live together in, in marital harmony, the, the shechina, Hashem's presence, uh, resides between the couple. Okay, and it's significant really that these were the brachot of Sarah, that these values that we, these mitzvot that we do today are associated with the first, really, of our imahot. We strive to emulate the imahot in many ways in terms of their character. And for sure, if we study the character of Sarah, that could be a class in and of itself. Um, we will see that she was really embodied um, Jewish values. And that's something that we strive to embody within ourselves and something that we strive to instill within our homes. Now, there's another parallel where um, I think we could see these mitzvot. Um, it's in a place in Sefer Shemot is where this place comes up. Um, it's a place that's built by the Jewish people. Does anyone have, anybody have any ideas? Mishkan, right? In the Mishkan. So how does that work, right? We have a mitzvah of chala in the Mishkan, right? On the Shulchan, the Lechem HaPanim was on the Shulchan, right? We have the candles in the Mishkan, the, the lighting of the, of the menorah. Right, and we have the Shekhinah, of course, in the Mishkan, right? In the Kodesh Kodashim, on the Aron. Now, what's interesting, and perhaps this is only tangential, tangentially related, but related, I think, um, is all of these vessels, all of these Kelim, the Aron, the Shulchan, and the Menorah are in the Kodesh, in one area of the Mishkan. Now, there's another vessel in the Kodesh along with these things, and it's the Mizbeach Hazahab, the, the golden Mizbeach on which the incense were burnt upon. Interestingly, the first three, the Aron, the Menorah, and the Shulchan, are commanded, we read about the commandment to build those in Harashat Terumah, when Hashem commands the people to build the Mishkan initially. And the Mizbeach is left all the way after we have those three, we have a pause and it talks about um, the, the curtains and the boards and the nuts and bolts of how the Mishkan is going to be built together. And only after that, in the next parasha, parasha Titzabeh, do we read about the Mizbeach Hazahab. And I think that that's significant. It's as if the text is, is deliberately grouping these three things together, perhaps paralleling the group of these three mitzvot together. And how is that significant for us, right? We have the opportunity with these three mitzvot that are so clearly um, practiced in the Mishkan. So, so too, we can make our homes by practicing these mitzvot a, a little mini Mishkan, a little mini temple and a little mini sanctuary through our practice of our mitzvot. So now we get into candlelighting, okay? Uh, candlelighting, fulfills three halachic principles on Shabbat. It fulfills Kavod Shabbat, honoring Shabbat. It fulfills Onik Shabbat, enjoyment of Shabbat. And it fulfills the concept of Shalom Bayi. So let's go through each one of those. What's Kavod Shabbat? What's Kavod Shabbat? Just throw it out there. Right, but well, what, what does that entail? Okay. Doing something yeah, before Shabbat. 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 That's on it. Good. We're gonna get there too. Good. So, so Kavod Shabbat specifically, the way it's it's talked about in Halacha is things that we do before Shabbat for Shabbat. So, like 
exactly like if you had an important guest coming over, if you had a party, right? All of those special preparations that you would do to honor that, right? Those, the old, everything that we do to prepare for Shabbat, that's Kibod Shabbat, honoring Shabbat. Right, and candles fill, fulfill that, right? The Gemara says, Shabbat. We, we light candles to honor Shabbat. The Yakut Shimoni says, hen that the candles of Shabbat are the honor of Shabbat. Okay, then we have Onik Shabbat, enjoyment of Shabbat. So how do we enjoy Shabbat? On Shabbat, things that we do, enjoyable things that we do on Shabbat, right? We know Shabbat as not just a day of rest, right? It's a day to sort of nourish our spiritual side. So we have this, this commandment to enjoy Shabbat so that we enjoy our spiritual selves. We enjoy nourishing our neshama. So think about back in the day when there were no lights, right? It's not very enjoyable to sit and eat a meal in a dark room. It's enjoyable to sit with light around you. So once the candles are lit, it fulfills the, the concept, the commandment of owning Shabbat, of enjoying Shabbat. We, the rabbis derive this mitzvah from Pesukim in Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu was one of the prophets that lived pre the destruction of the first temple. Um, most of his prophecies are, are pretty positive, but he also his job is to kind of tell the people, you're not listening, you have to do better. Um, and in this Perek, in this chapter of part of when he's telling the people to do better, but it's interesting because this Perek talks about not only the people doing better, but it's the people being more sincere about what they're doing. So the beginning of the Perek starts with um, Hashem telling the people through the prophet, you fast and you do mitzvot, but at the same time, you're mean to each other and you oppress your laborers on the day of the fast. So the last pesukim of this parak, right? And you may recognize these pesukim. Im tashiv mi Shabbat raglecha asot chafatzecha beyom kodeshi. If you um, honor my Shabbat by by not doing your things that you want to do on my holy day, vikarata la Shabbat oneg, and you will declare Shabbat as a day of oneg, as a day of enjoyment, where not just enjoying it regular, enjoying it, meaning and basking in the holiness of the day. Right, to honor the day um, and, and to go and, and to not do things that you want to do, mundane things that you normally do on Shabbat, right? So then what will you merit? As titanag al Hashem, then you will, you, you will, find enjoyment from God. The, the word tit anag, it's reflexive. It's like the oneg will come back to you, okay? And God will ride you on the heights of the, of the land. And God will feed you from the, from the land of Yaakov. Um, the commentaries also um, point out why why specifically Yeshayahu mentions Nachalat Yaakov as opposed to Abraham and Yitzchak. And in, in Bereshit, the way that 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 Eretz Yisrael and the promised land is described to the Avot is different. Um, with Abraham, it, it gives boundaries. With Yitzchak, it gives boundaries. And forgive me for not having the Pesukim, but it's, it's such a beautiful concept. And with Yaakov, Hashem says, yama matzafona banegba. You should expand and go out in all different directions. So it says, if God is saying that, the reward um, will be sort of boundless and limitless. Okay. So that's where the rabbis derive this um, this commandment and obligation for Onik Shabbat, for the enjoyment of Shabbat. And then we have Shalom Bayit, right? Lighting candles fulfills um, our obligation, commandment, uh, responsibility, right? For Shalom Bayit, for peace in the home. How does that work? Well, we said before, if there's no light in the home, it's not very enjoyable to be in the home. If everybody's bumping into each other and tripping and yelling, right? That's not very conducive to Shalom Bayit. If you remember last summer, uh, when there was a blackout on Friday night. Does everybody remember that, right? And it was, it was some people were in the middle of the meal, some people were before the meal. It was, it was, it was a little chaotic. Ever since then, I, I find I never have to, you know, try very hard to explain how candlelight promotes shalom bite, right? We all, we all sort of experienced that. And it's funny, we all ran to the Shabbat candles because it was the only, 
only place that we had light. I think we were like starting a meal and couldn't because we were like candles went kitchen and meals in the dining room. And um, so I, I, you know, it's you, you really see how the candles and how the light um, are conducive to this concept of shalom bite, right? On the practical level today, we have electric lights. So, okay, so we have lights all over the place. We don't need the candlelight to not stumble over each other. But there's something spiritual to candles too, right? Candles are very, by nature, they're very calming. When you want to like set a mood, you light a candle, right? It's very calming to look at a candle. We also have a couple of significant comparisons in, in Sefer Mishlei in the book of Proverbs where, where candles are, so the first one, right? Kiner mitzvah Torah or the, the Torah is compared to light and mitzvot are compared to candles. That's one. Um, and the second one is ner uh, Hashem nishmat adam. The nishama, the soul of a person, is like a candle from Hashem. So when you think of these comparisons and you look at the candles, light symbolizing Torah, light symbolizing our nishama, you can see how the candles enhance spiritual homes and, and is conducive to that sort of peaceful feeling in the home. There is a Gemara in Masech Shabbat, where one of the rabbis goes for what to keep in terms of Shabbat in a situation where a person is limited in his finances. And the Gemara is as follows. I'm a rabbi. This is the rabbi who said it. This is obvious to me. If a person is limited financially, he could only afford his Shabbat candles or Chanukah candles. He cannot afford both. Ner beto adif, the Shabbat candles take precedence. Ner beto v'kidush hayom, if he cannot afford Shabbat candles and wine for Shabbat, to make kidush, ner beto adif, the Shabbat candles take precedence. Why? Mishum shalom bayit. He says because of shalom bayit. Now, to understand how powerful this is, right, we, we already said that all these things, Kavod Shabbat, Onik Shabbat, all of those are the Rabbanan from the rabbis. They're mitzvot that the rabbis command us to do. Kiddush is a mitzvat ased de oraita. It's a positive commandment from the Torah. So Rabbi here in the Gemara is saying that we, we prioritize a rabbinic level commandment over a Torah level commandment for Shalom Bay. Right? It says if God kind of is like Mochel, he like, um, uh, he, he puts away, he sets aside his own kavod um, in fulfilling the Torah level commandment and, and you know, the rabbinic level commandment sort of takes precedence, um, Mishum Shalom Bay, in order to maintain um, a peaceful home. Another thing I think that is very relevant to candle lighting, and I think that people automatically think of when they think of candle lighting, is the concept of prayer. Right? We all pray when we light candles. Women have been doing this for, for centuries, for generations. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a fascinating book um, by, by somebody named Aliza Lavi. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She, she, was in, she is. She's, she's an Israeli politician. She, I think she was a Knesset member. Um, and she came out with this book in 2005 called Tfilat Nashim, uh, Women's Prayers. And what's so interesting to go, it's so interesting to go through the book. It's a compilation of women's prayers that either women wrote or that rabbis wrote for women for different points in their lives. So holidays, uh, significant milestones, the birth of a child, the wedding of a of a sibling, of whatever, her own wedding, whatever it is, and, and it's specific to Philot for women for different points in their lives. And there's a nice handful of Tefilot for candlelight. And what's what's nice to see is how these Tefilot come from all over the world. They span generations. So there's there's prayers in there from, from the 12th and 13th century, which is amazing that she was able to, to sort of compile that. So women have, you know, we, we all kind of, say our own thing. Some of us say there's a Yehi Ratzon that goes after candle lighting and we all kind of have our own things that we pray for. But what's amazing is that women have been doing this really for generations and some of them either recorded these prayers or they just passed it on verbally from generation to generation and, and they, they exist in this book today. Um, Rabbeinu Bechaye, a 13th century 
Torah scholar. He wrote a commentary on all of Hamisha Chumshei Torah, on all of the Torah. So very Shichmot like Rabbi Midbar Devari. Um, he actually also has a Tzibri line in the book that he wrote, I think. Um, he makes the following statement. He says in one of his commentaries, in Sefer Shmot, he says, yoter nishma'at bish'at asiyat ma'aseh. Prayer is, is heard more at the time that you're doing an action, namely a mitzvah, okay? Now, really, we could say this about all mitzvah. Anytime you do a mitzvah, it's, it's, what, it's an et ratzon. It's a time of, of we're, we're connecting to God, right? That's what, why do we do mitzvah? But that could also be its own class, why do you do mitzvah? But sim quite simply for our purposes, right, one of the reasons we do mitzvah is, is to connect to God. So when we're connecting to God, when we're connecting to Hashem, it's like I'm taking, I don't want to say taking advantage in the negative sense, but taking advantage and, and I'm here, I'm in your presence. So, so let, me just, let me just pray. Let me strengthen that connection. Let me prolong that connection, right? Anytime we do mitzvah, it's appropriate to pray. So what's, what's fascinating is where Rabbeinu Bechaye makes the statement and then the example that he gives this statement about. So really what's fascinating is, is the pasuk that he says the statement on is a pasuk in, like I said, Sefer Shmot, in Perek Yutet. Um, Perek Yutet is, is obviously before Perek Kaf. Perek Kaf is, of Sefer Shmot is the Aseret Hadibro. So what's happening is the scene right now is Ma'amad Har Sinai. Jewish people are standing around Har Sinai about to get the Torah. And they're waiting for instructions. And Moshe, so they're camped around Har Sinai, like I said, right? We have the famous, right? Vayichan, Sham, Yisrael, Neged, Haha, right? They were all like one. That's why Lashon, okay? Um, right? Moshe goes up to Hashem. Moshe ala el ha'elohim. Vayikra elav Hashem in Har. Hashem calls him from the mountain. Let more say Go tell the house of Yaakov and tell B'nai Israel. Okay, so what's the question? What's my, what's my question on that pasu? Hmm? Yeah, why does it say twice, right? We don't know, we know the Torah doesn't waste words. So what's Bet Yaakov and what's B'nai Israel? Say the commentaries. Bet Yaakov is the women. B'nai Israel are the men. Now, I think it's worth just sort of internalizing and thinking about what this means, right? Already from the get-go, right before we got the Torah, Hashem is telling Moshe, make sure you tell the men, make sure you tell the women. Okay, so very nice. We have men and women in the Jewish people. Okay, we know we have men and women. What's, what? Right? Why can't you just tell everyone together? What do you think? Different mitzvot. And what else? Different, different ways to tell them. Good. Different mitzvot. Different ways to tell them. Different perspectives. Right. The commentaries actually go through what the actual differences are, which could probably also yield some very interesting conversations and in how they think. Right. How they think women should be spoken to. How they think men should be spoken to. What words? What language? Right. Um, fascinating. For, but for another time. But I, but I think what's significant here is that already from the get go. This concept of men and women having different perspectives and different ways of relating to Torah and of living Torah and of doing mitzvah, that's already a premise from before the Torah was even given, right? It's also the premise of why we're all here today, right? Is, is to relate to, to Torah and mitzvot in our own special way. But, but I, it, it's worth really internalizing and thinking about how um, powerful and significant that is that from the get-go, Hashem says to Moshe, you know, make sure you talk to the women and make sure you talk to the men. So on, it's on that pasuk that Rabbeinu Bechaye says that prayer is heard more in the time of doing a mitzvah. Okay, and now the example that he gives, which is also fascinating, what's going to be the example? What's going to be the example? Candlelighting. Candlelighting. <laughs> Right? It's going to be candlelighting. That's exactly what he says. He says that in the, when women light candles, it's an appropriate time for them to pray to Hashem, for them to pray for their children, specifically for them to pray for their children to go in the ways of Torah, right? Again, um, 
jumping on those parallels in, in Mishle of how Torah is compared to light. So we pray by the light um, that our children should go right in the ways of Torah and really just using our um, abilities as women to promote Shalom Bayit, to pray for our children as we are doing our mitzvah that is designated for us of, of lighting candles. Oh. Um, good. Another thing I think is, is maybe worth thinking about um, is why he specifically picked candle lighting. If we want to pick a mitzvah that pertains to a woman, so what might you think of from the three? Nida, right? Because a man literally can't do nida. I mean, obviously we need his, his partnership in doing it, but right, a man can't go to the mikveh to change his status from tameh to tahor. He could go for spiritual reasons, and it's very nice, and some men choose to do that on um, different point, in different points of the year, some weekly, some before Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Um, but, right, I would think nida because it's like the ultimate mitzvah of a woman, but that's not what he picks. And and chala, so chala is also designated for women because it's 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 a mitzvah that we have to take dough, um, take some dough from the bread that we make. And and the reality was is, is is that women are the ones typically in the home preparing the food. But hypothetically, if a man bakes bread, he's also obligated to be mafrish chala. So that's the same. Candle lighting is unique in that women and men are actually both obligated to candle lighting, but the preference is given to the woman, right? The Rambam writes, echad, echad hanashim echad hanashim chayabim. The household is obligated to have candles lit in it. Both the men and the woman are obligated to light candles. So in the event that the, the, the woman is not around, so the man can light, but when she's around, priority is given to her so much so that if he steals the mitzvah from her, he has to pay her. We have a concept of when we steal the mitzvah, a mitzvah from someone, when we take away that opportunity from them, so it's 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 mamash stealing, like it's really stealing, and you have to pay for it, just like you would have to pay when you steal something. Um, and, and that applies to candlelighting, right? The priority of, of candles being given to women as something that they do is so strong that if a man tries to take it away, he needs to pay her. So I think that really candlelighting um, is, is unique in that way in that they're both obligated, but really we see the very strong priority to women. Um, another thing, we talked a little bit about how the parallels of women's brachot into the mishkan so on that note, um, I think it's worth looking at the menorah a little bit um, and, and looking at what lessons we can, we can glean from that. So the, the menorah is actually, so I, I told you that the menorah was mentioned in Parashat Terumah. It's actually in Sefer Shemot. It's also mentioned in Sefer Vayikra. And there's an interesting midrash there, which we'll get to. And then it's also talked about in Sefer Bemibar. So again, Another conversation for another time, why we have the same thing mentioned three different times. Torah does this a lot. Um, fascinating thing to explore. Um, but it is, in fact, mentioned in all three places. So in Sefer Bemibar, we have in the beginning of Parasha Beha'alotecha, um, Aharon is commanded on the candles. Right? 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 Aharon is commanded to light the menorah candles. So, right, we said it's, it's, it's written in a bunch of places, the menorah, and, and so since it's written in a bunch of places, the commentaries pick up on this specific placement of why the Aharon was commanded right here, and they answer that it's because the event preceding Aharon's being commanded to light the menorah are the gifts of the Nisi'im. The Nisi'im were like the, the heads. Each Shevet, each tribe had a Nasi, like somebody in charge of their Shevet, of their tribe. And when the Mishkan was, was built, so the Mishkan is being built at the end of Sefer Shemot, right? We have the four parshiot of the Mishkan, Terumat Hitzaveh, Kitisa Ezcheta Egel, and Vayakel Pikdei is more Mishkan. Vayikra is the first day of the Mishkan being built, the celebration of, of the Mishkan being built. And 
essentially like Sefer Vayikra, like all of Sefer Vayikra essentially happens like in a week. Um, and then we have Bim Bar. So Bim Bar, we're, we're still kind of celebrating the, the building of the Mishkan. And what, what was happening during that week of celebration is that each head of the tribe had a day and gave Korbanot to, as representing his tribe and as like a voluntary thing to, to you know, give a sacrifice to God, expressing gratitude, expressing excitement, right? Expressing this newness of having this place of worship. Uh, each each um, nasi, right? Each, each person, head of tribe had a day and he would um, bring those sacrifices. So say the commentaries, Aharon felt left out because he was not a nasi. And he didn't get to give any voluntary korbanot. He's very sad about that. So because of that comes uh, this commandment of you, you know, Aharon, you are going to be the one to light the menorah. Okay, so a few we're gonna say a few things about that. First of all, why is Aharon um, sort of appeased by candles? Aharon also he gets to do the Avodah on Yom Kippur. He's literally the only person that's allowed to walk into the Kodesh Kodashim. He's the only person that can do the Avodah on Yom Kippur. And that's not what Hashem appeases him with. He appeases him with candles. Okay. Um, and then, right, why, why was he satisfied with a mitzvah in which he's commanded to do? The Nisi'im, it was voluntary, right? Voluntary like they wanted to do it. And now Aharon, his, his sort of consolation prize is, is something that he has to do. So how does that work? So why candles? The Ramban answers this um, with something so, so nice. Um, says the Ramban, why was Aharon appeased with candles is because the Korbanot eventually became, unfortunately, the Avonotenu Haravim, and our, you know, sins, they, they became irrelevant, right? Ben Hamidash, you don't have Ben Hamidash today. The, everything about Korbanot today is practically irrelevant, is irrelevant, right? Whereas the Menorah is not. Even though we don't have a Ben Hamikdash and we don't have a Mishkan, we, we continue to light Hanukkah candles. And, and, and says the Ramban that this was sort of told to Aharon Beruach HaKodesh that the mitzvah of, of lighting the menorah, lighting these candles, would, would continue forever. So that's why this was an appeasement for Aharon. Don't worry, Aharon. Your thing is not going to last, but your thing sort of is, in a nutshell. But it, it's a beautiful concept. Now, um, let's talk about this next this next question, which which I don't think the Ramban actually answers, but maybe we can come up with it. So why he asks the question, why was Aharon appeased by by a, something that he's commanded to do? Like you said, right? The the Nisi'im had this like voluntary thing that they did, right? I, I want to do something. It, it, it's I, I feel you know, I want to connect to Hashem. I, I feel inspired, I want to do something. So you would think that that would be a greater show of dedication than we have to do something, right? I, I, I have to do something, I have to do it, right? How does that show my dedication? I do it because I have to do it. Whereas when you do something voluntary, it's like extra, right? But when you, I, I, I think that when you do something voluntary, so you, you could argue that perhaps it shows more sincerity, but it's a one and done. I do it when I'm inspired and then that's it. The next time I do it is maybe when the next time I'm inspired. Aharon, through the way the language of the psukim, the commentaries tell us that, first of all, uh, it was Aharon and his sons that were commanded to light the menorah, and Aharon took the responsibility upon himself. The sons never did it. He did it. He took it upon himself as his thing. Was what he, what he was dedicated to doing it, right? And he did it so, every day he did it so excitedly. He, he was always excited to, even though he was commanded to do it, he did it with such passion and such excitement and such dedication, right? That that was stronger than what the Nisi'im brought voluntarily. And I think how that's relevant to us is we have these mitzvot, candle lighting, we light candles every week. But the lesson that we could take from Aharon is that this thing that we're commanded to do, there's so much within it to show our dedication, to show our excitement, take it, to make it our own, right? Also going back to Kotomar, Lebet Yaakov, Tagilu, Bnei Israel, we all have different perspectives. We all have 
um, I think this this ability, this obligation, or, or even this, when something's meaningful to you, you, you take it, you make it your own, you give it your own perspective. So we really have the ability to do that with our candlelighting. And I think that we really, we see that from Aharon. I think it's something that we can easily learn from him um, and his approach to lighting candles. Uh, the last place in which the menorah is mentioned, like I said, is in Sefer Vaikra. Um, and this is not really connected so much to menorah, although the Midrash quotes it in, in the context of menorah. The Midrash um, recounts an, a very interesting conversation between Hashem and Adam, Adam HaRishon firsthand. And the conversation goes like this. Hashem tells man, Nercha biyadi, right? Your candle is in my hands, v'neri beyadcha, and my candle is in your hands. What's God talking about, right? Nercha biyadi, your candle is in my hands, that's our neshamot, right? We said, ner Hashem nishmat adam, our, our neshamot are like a candle from Hashem, right? Veneri beyadcha, and, and my candle is in your hands, right? What are God's candles? Perhaps the menorah, perhaps our Shabbat candles, right? All of the candle, um, candle lighting commandments that we have from God, those are, those are like Hashem's candles. Hashem tells Adam like this, if you light my candle, I will light your candle. <coughs> what does this mean? Right? We know that candlelight is special in that you could have one flame and it could give an infinite amount of flames light and, and that light will never be diminished. So I think what we could take from this midrash right, is that we take our candle of Hashem that we have inside of us, we take our neshamot, we use that to spread the light of Torah, and it doesn't diminish our neshamot in any way. And I think that's what this Midrash is trying to teach us, that that's our obligation, that's what we should be doing, perhaps as women, that's, that's our special job, right? Especially with, with women lighting candles and candles instilling this concept of shalom bayit in the house, right? It sets the tone for for the Shabbat, for what, what the house is going to be like. It's, it's going back to, to preparing. It's almost like the last preparation that you do, lighting candles, right? You go from like rush, 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 and then like light candles, and then like it all instantaneously the rush stops. It's like the last prep that you have, right? And that's something that like that we do, that we have the ability to do. It's like we, we literally transform the hall into Kodesh, with the, the mundane into, into the holy um, with this act of candle lighting. So, so right, going back to the Midrash, we use the light of our neshama to light up our homes, to light up the world. So in the merit of our performance of mitzvot, specifically of our lighting candles, may we merit to have the light of Torah shine within our homes, shine within our lives forever and always. Amen. Amen. Anybody has questions? I'm very happy to take them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there a proper way to light candles? Like, do they tell you what to do? Is it you follow your mother? Like, there, what's so the... There are different minhagim. The halacha, the halacha books do talk about it, yes. So there seem to be two very prevalent minhagim right now. So there seem to be, um, right, you say the bracha and then you light the candles, which is the way that many Sephardic women do um, as, as, as written, as told by Chama Vadya Yosef. But then, so Chama Vadya Yosef says that you say the beracha and then you light. However, there's another very prevalent minhag, which many um, Ashkenazim do, but Sephardic women also do it as well, where they light and then they say the beracha. So what, what do you want to, what do you do? So, you could either do what your mother does, or when a woman gets married, she could establish her own minhag and do it that way. I don't like the way that my mother lights. Um, my husband follows the Piskei Halacha of Hamul Yosef. So I, when I got married, I took it upon myself to say the Beracha and then light. Um, but there are many women who light and then say the Bracha, and that's a very prevalent <coughs> minhag, it's a very valid minhag. So I would say it's really up to you. Um, two questions. Is there a significance to using oil over wax candles? 
there is, the Gemara talks about it um, and says that the light that comes from oil is nicer um, than that comes from wax. So it's, it's like a hidur mitzvah type of thing. It's like a glorifying the mitzvah, but wax is perfectly fine and acceptable. You shouldn't feel like, you know, you're lighting your candles any less if you use wax candles. And what about covering your head when you say the barakah? So that, that yes. Um, the reason for that is because really any time a woman says Shem Hashem, her hair should be covered. We have a concept of, of once a woman gets married, Se'ar Be'isha Erva. And, and any Erva, anything that needs, that is typically covered, should be covered when saying Shem Hashem. The same way that you wouldn't say Bracha like if you're not dressed. Right? Like there are parts of your body that have to be covered when you're saying a bracha. So once a woman gets married, her hair halachically, right? We're not talking hashkafically now, we're talking halachically, um, takes it on that status. Okay, thank you. I don't know why it might be a dumb one, but every time Never. in the summer, especially. If I'm going out, this is my, my worst question in the world. Do I light? If I have a baby at home, I'm leaving the baby. I don't want to light the candle. Can I light by my sister? Like when my in-laws come to me, I tell them, do they light two candles with me? Like that whole part of leaving and not coming, or do I drive, do I light and I drive, but then I'm not leaving the mundane enough when I light. So all these things bother me when I have to go somewhere. Okay, okay. So there's, there's a lot, you said a lot, so we're gonna try to unpack <laughs> <laughs> So we're gonna try to unpack this one by one. Um, I'm gonna preface with saying that, um, you know, I'm, Definitely not a uh, halachic or rabbinic authority. So, it's oh, always, what's the difference between hashkafah and halachah? What? What's the difference between hashkafah and halachah? That's a great question. Um, the difference between hashkafah and halachah is hashkafah is like philosophy more, and halachah is like yeah. what we have to do. Okay. Um, so, so to answer, to start to answer your questions is, is of course, you can also always consult your, your rabbinic authority. But I'm going to tell you what. Um, I have answered women who ask me this and who I'm assuming when they ask me this, they would accept halakha as, um, you know, sort of taught or being posek, um, like by my husband. So, um, <coughs> you said at home, if you're not eating at home, so ideally you should light at home, even if you're not eating at home. However, there's of course, many, many, many concerns for safety. Many women don't want to leave open candles and open flames. Um, if they're not in the house, it's very, very valid. If that's the case, then you should say the bracha on a light, on a light switch. Say yeah, the bracha and turn on the light switch. Or shelter that. I do that, but then what if I know that if, by the time I leave, my house is shut in at home? So she should. You have to leave it on also that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, she shuts it by mistake, like, you know, your house is not going to burn down, but like, you know. Right. Ideally, it should be something that yeah, you're going to move on. Um, in terms of going somewhere or, or people coming to you, so again, I don't know. There are different minhagim um, and different way that, that people do this. Um, as far as I know and, and what I tell people and what I actually do, when you are home, so you like your candles, people coming to you, they would... Um, fulfill their obligation by answering amen to your beracha. If they want to light and say the beracha for themselves, they should light in a different room. So, because you already said a bracha on candles. So so to say another bracha on candles, according to some, would be like a bracha levatala, like a wasted bracha. Again, that's not like the only reason. It could be that there are other, um, you know, Opinions that say otherwise, but that's the, that's what I know from what about the Safari way of Kamala. Yeah. Is there something with like giving them a dollar, giving them a dollar, and like paying them to like be a part of their mitzvah? Oh, yeah. no, it could be. <laughs> this is how much they'll say that's giving them a dollar. Oh, so you're sharing it? Interesting. I, I don't actually know. I don't know. Interesting. Interesting kind of. I, I, I don't, that I, I don't know. Um, Sarah, did I answer one of your questions? I'm going to call you this week. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, 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 okay. So this is, so this is interesting also. Um, so we do have, and, and this comes up actually in a lot of places, right? It also comes up with like actually Friday night, typically 
there, right? That's press but candles off, right? And, and then and then walk. But um what do you do to light and then you have to dry the person? So you could light a little earlier because we do have this conduct of Tosef and Shabbat. We have to add some time um to Shabbat. So you could light and then just have in mind not to accept Shabbat and then accept Shabbat when you get there. Um you could do that or you can say I'm in today but I'm not as close with them. Again, consult your rabbinic authority, local rabbinic authority for, for best way to see for you. Yes. So, so that probably definitely should not do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but you could light in a different room of their house. But so, yes, you could light in a different room of their house with your own bracha. So this way, you do get to say the bracha. Um, and if that's not possible, uh, and it's their house, really the baalat habayit should should say it. Um, interesting. Possibly again, consult your rabbinic authority. <laughs> if people live in the same house and they're not a guest. They light in two sets of rooms. Well, uh, uh, they yes. don't have to. They could light together, like and one, right? Like when I, Ma, when I lived with you in Deal, right? We, you lit one, and we all, the daughters and daughter yeah, but, set them in. No, but when my mother used to light, Rabbi Aluf came and he said, "Put it in another room. You can't have them all in the same." Right, right. So, so again, it, 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 I think it's your preference. I'm not sure that one is better halachically than the other. Um, some women feel very strongly that. They want to say the bracha themselves, so then that's a good option for them. And some could just say amen, and you can all light together as one. So and now, she lights? Yeah, of course. So now, when you're lighting, so I'll be like, I like to light early. So I light 20 minutes, half hour early, or like whatever the, the allowed. Mm -hmm. But I have all of them in the house, and they may not want to. I don't accept mm -hmm. it only. Sometimes, like they live at the beginning of the year, you can say, I'm not going to accept that when they light candles, I'm going to accept that when it comes. So I like to take the, the candle, the kebab, the candle, for some reason, leave it for some reason, and then I'm going to leave the dinner for the long term. They light it early, but what about all the other ones living in the house, like my daughters and my babies, if they don't want them to light again, or is it okay if we light it once in the house? Yeah, so they don't light again. That, that they would. You know, they would whatever they would they would have in mind to just like not accept Shabbat with more candle lighting and then but they should have in mind to accept Shabbat meaning as soon as they're done what they need to do. Um in terms of so how do you accept it? It's just you just like verbally just say like I you know now I'm accepting Shabbat. It's it it best practice and, and I totally know this doesn't work out that way. Guilty as charged. Best practice is to really accept Shabbat when you light a candle and that's the whole point. Life is messy. They said that you don't have to. You don't have to. It meaning, meaning there's this, there's this out in that. Like if it's still early enough, you could not accept Shabbat, and then this way you still do melacha even though you lit candles, um, because the, the the whole the issue of a, of a woman of a woman lighting candles and accepting Shabbat is like, okay, well maybe she already said Shabbat, so she can't do anything. Versus the reality of oh, but it's still daylight, so maybe I can. Like that's something that comes up um, in, in many places. Again, I, ideally you should whenever you light, you should accept Shabbat. But so, like, nothing in the kitchen, nothing in the thing. Like that's when it that happens. It's not bringing out the platters and the things. Like, the well, bringing out the platters, you would do that. That's not melacha. I mean, by melacha, I mean like turning on the stove and you know things like that. I have a question, but not that it happens often. Let's say you need a moment you could do just light, and then you remember 10 minutes later, like, I want to go burn lights. My life is done. I feel worse not to have to do that. Okay. I, I know. I this happened to me twice. I said that didn't happen twice. <laughs> yeah, this this happened to me twice. What, what was the question? Um, she forgot to light candles. She just forgot. And then it was Shabbat. I mean, that's like, like, I just like the candles. I just don't. I just forgot. So again, it, go for the it depends what time it is, really. I mean, so we candle lighting is typically 18 minutes before sunset. Um, I would not recommend lighting at the 18th minute, but officially it's 18 minutes before sunset. Um, past that, you really can't. 
No, like you really can't. Like it's worse. It's worse to light the candle on Shabbat than to be without the candles on Shabbat. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's worse. <laughs> so don't do that. But also know that you're not alone, and it's something that happens, and we're all busy. And here is what's bad: when you're having a rabbi over for Shabbat dinner, and the men go to early minyan because they want to eat before. The Omer, wait, it's not Shabbat dinner, I guess during the Omer, Shabbat dinner, and they want to start for the Omer, so they go to early Mian and they come home before candle any time, and you start making kiddush and then notice that we didn't like the candle. Is that too late? That's all right. It should have been. Let's say you know you're going to wait and you're going to run into the 18 minutes. Is it preferable to light at the right time and not accept Shabbat, or is it just push it all until you finish? I always wonder about that. Good question. Um, I think you should probably light first so you don't forget to light. And then yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not like obligatory, but it's a nice thing huh? to give to that pile of candle lighting. It's it's just, it's a nice thing have to do like it's like while it's it's just like to basically like you know do more meets both together right and lighting candles and giving to the path maybe it's you know you maybe shmat somebody maybe it's for somebody's rituals like that the concept is just to to sort of add more meets both so it's a nice very nice thing to do but but it's not like if I don't do it it's like my candle lighting class you know what I mean I like in the same class well Oh, that's Still, a great question. Because sometimes I didn't do the time during the class last year. Oh, let me do this. So I don't like, I don't know what to do. Do I light and then do the time as well? Or do I do my time as well and then light and say I'm 18 minutes? Can I ask a question on Amalada? Of course. I mean, I don't know if I'm on every week. And I don't do Hafrashat, but is that like an obligatory mitzvah for women? So good, that's a great question. Hafrasha Chala is not, we don't have um, a meat, like you don't have to bake bread so you could do Hafrasha, right? Like there's no obligation that says like you must bake bread every week so that you can do Hafrasha Chala, right? Um, if you do break bread and you bake the proper amount of bread, then you're obligated to do the Hafrasha, right? If, if you don't, then it's not like you, it's, you didn't do anything wrong by, by not baking the bread, because, and, and not doing have fresh shots. You know what I'm saying? It, it's if you're in that situation where you bake the bread, then you have the obligation to do that. But don't go out of your way to bake the bread if I'm not going to bake Oh, yeah. Especially like if it's going to be wasted. I mean, you could no, do you it. would donate it. Oh, okay, fine. Stage, so that's but... nice. But again, that's, that's like a personal decision. Do you know what I'm saying? You don't need to get together and it's not, it's the same amen to my that I'm not. Of course. You can say amen to your mom. Yeah. Even over FaceTime, like she FaceTimed me. <laughs> well, COVID clearly, you know, showed us that I don't look with her. That that you know, sometimes things where you know, we, perhaps when we would have not said these situations are okay halachically, you know, COVID really showed us otherwise. But why is FaceTime not okay? <laughs> Seriously, we have family FaceTime. She FaceTime like, I'm the daughter. Baby, we all do. I don't. I don't think it's. It's. I don't think that it's not okay. They give the They see the fire. They see the match. They see the thing. Like, yeah. I, I, not. I'm, I'm not exactly. I'm, I'm sure that there is. I'm sure that there are different opinions. Listen. Again, in COVID, there were many people. I mean, in COVID, this question came up a lot. Can you do a virtual minyan and count it as a minyan? Some said yes and some said no. You know, could yeah. help here. Yeah, Like, I make the Naraha, she says I'm in, and lights her, and they each like, one Naraha because it's all one light. Right, right, but interesting. 
That's interesting. That has to work. I don't actually know. Uh, also, well, one time I've gotten many candles. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to believe at this point, but my parents are my grandparents married for a long time. Can you switch switch the flip in a bathroom? Probably not an LED. Right. Okay. So not an LED light. Not an LED light.